uh, there's a lot of small important not very important things in the beginning before we start the actual topic of the circulation through the heart that right? you're studying about the heart in the second part okay so in the first part of the chapter you're learning about the like first topic is need for transport inside the body transport means movement of substances from one place to the other place so blood not only is like blood the main thing that's happening in the blood is there are things that are being transported from one place to the other place in the body so what are some of the examples of transportation taking place through the blood what is the purpose of the blood why does the blood have to move carrying oxygen from where to where lungs to all parts of the body right think of your blood as a bus service transporting things from one place to the other place okay so the blood comes to the lungs picks up oxygen takes it to every cell in the body and distributes that oxygen to every cell then from those cells it takes carbon dioxide brings the carbon dioxide to the lungs and then expels it out same thing the blood next it goes to the stomach from the stomach and intestines what does it get all the nutrients then it takes those nutrients and goes to every cell in the body transports uh, distributes it there keeps moving as it is moving it's taking something putting something taking something giving something right so that's what the blood is doing so if the blood stops pumping if your heart stops pumping what's happening is this bus service is gone there is no distribution of substances removal of waste giving food giving oxygen taking carbon dioxide all these things stop and your body cannot function because your cells continuously need all these raw materials cells need oxygen cells need food only then they can respire cells give out waste materials those wastes have to be taken out disposed of kidneys have to clean the uh, blood so this has to keep on going right so that is one very important process of the blood another thing is hormones hormones are transported through the blood we have not learned that chapter yet have we but in smaller classes you have learned the endocrine system and all the different hormones one hormone is secreted in the brain but that one's effect is felt in another place in the body so how do these hormones reach those different places through the blood right it's a slow process because blood travels at a certain speed so it takes time for the hormones to reach okay but yeah it passes through the hormones now there's two fluids that circulates in the body not only blood there's one more fluid what is it called blood is not the only sir ah lymph okay now what is this lymph okay in the last part of the chapter you will be studying more about the lymph here yeah, functions of the lymph Okay, that's the last topic in this chapter. But in the beginning, they are explaining a little bit about what the lymph is. All right. So first, there is blood. Blood is inside the arteries, veins, and capillaries. They are always within these blood vessels. They never come out of it. If the blood comes out of the blood vessels, like through the walls, capillaries. You know what are capillaries? See, from your heart, the blood goes out as a through arteries. arteries will split into what capillaries capillaries so capillaries are these very tiny blood vessels okay they are so thin they are even thinner than your hair so small and through these tiny blood vessels cells and the blood moves cell by cell there is only that much space it's very small and the walls of the capillary also is very very thin it's like single cell thickness it's not even double cell no not even two layers of cells single layer of cells and that thin it is so through the through the gaps between the cells the blood is able to ooze out okay so the blood that comes out of the capillaries and it it goes and forms something called tissue fluid because it's around the cells in the body so it's called tissue fluid and right, so that is a second fluid then as this tissue fluid keeps becoming more and more they have to be drained out they have to be taken away from the tissues and they have to be put back into the blood vessels so they are taken back taken back through another system called the lymphatic system and so this tissue fluid when it goes through the lymphatic system it is called the lymph okay lymph is the blood itself but it is a blood which is drained out from the from the tissues So here is a diagram of how these things happen. What I what I've drawn over here. So arteries split into capillaries. From the capillaries, blood comes out and becomes tissue fluid. Tissue fluid is drained through the lymph vessels, lymph capillaries, lymph uh, that liquid that 
blood which goes through the lymphatic system is called the lymph that is taken it passes through certain lymph nodes in the body and then it is drained back into the blood vessels at which point just before reaching the heart it goes back and joins the blood vessels okay see now when we are drawing this we use two different color codings the arteries were drawn in red color and the veins which took the blood back to the heart was represented in blue color what's the difference between the blood in the arteries and the blood in the veins oxygen. yeah the blood in the arteries is filled with oxygen okay and that oxygen is supplied to every cell in the body yes. and by the time the blood comes back to the heart there is no oxygen there is only carbon dioxide okay now is is the blood actually blue in color no what is the color of the blood like the blood in the arteries and the blood in the veins what is the color Like, 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 dark, dark. See the blood from the artery the blood is somewhat thick bright red when taken from an artery or dark red when taken from a vein so the oxygenated blood is bright red and the deoxygenated blood which does not have oxygen is dark red okay, that is the actual color of the blood See this diagram shows you where the lungs is. Look, a general idea. The lungs oxygenate the blood. The oxygenated blood comes into the heart, and then from the heart it goes out, gets distributed throughout the body, comes back into the heart, the oxygenated blood. Then that goes into the lungs for oxygenation, and then comes back into the heart. So there are two circulations happening over here. Right, one circulation is passing, going through the body, and the other circulation is only to the lungs. The, there's a word for this. The circulation which takes place through the whole body is called systemic circulation, and the circulation which takes place in the lungs is called pulmonary circulation. Okay, systemic and pulmonary. So this, since there are two circulations taking place in our body, it's called a double circulation. Certain animals there's only one circulation, like heart, lungs, whole body comes back. One circulation. So lungs and the body is in one round itself, but for us how it is? Two separate circulations. One circulation to the lungs and back to the heart. Second circulation, body and back to the heart. Okay. The reason is because it's more efficient this way. It's a much better, less load on the heart to do this particular type of circulation. Okay. Some interesting things here. There are also some non-circulating fluids in your body, like the fluid in your eyes. Okay. Then there's synovial fluid. That is the fluid between your bones. Okay. Between two bones, there's a cartilage. Between the two cartilage for lubrication, you have this fluid. It's called synovial fluid. The fluid in the eyes is called vitreous humor and aqueous humor. What are these words? Okay. The whole ball, eyeball. There's a fluid inside called vitreous humor. And there's another fluid in the front here, just be in front of the lens, between the lens and your outer part of the eye, that is called aqueous humor. Okay, you'll be learning about that in the chapter sense organs. <clears throat> Properties of the blood. Is the blood stationary? No, if it's stationary, then there's no point. The blood has to move. Only then it transports things. Okay. Color we saw. Volume. What's the volume of blood? Five to six liters. This bottle is how many liters? Two liters. So three of these bottles of blood is there in your body. It's a lot of blood passing through your body. What's the taste of blood? Have you tasted blood? Yeah, if you get a cut in your mouth, that's the time you taste blood. It is salty. It tastes bloody. It tastes bloody. Eh? So what what taste is bloody taste is the question. Okay, it is salty. Yeah. Okay. What taste is pH? I mean, not what taste is pH. What is the pH of the blood? In acids, bases, salts, we learned about pH scale. What is the pH of normal water, like neutral water? Seven. Okay. Anything above seven, seven to fourteen, what happens? Becomes basic. Basic or alkaline. And if the pH is less than seven, it becomes acidic. So the our blood's pH is 7.3 to 7.45 what does it mean is it acidic or basic huh? uh, 
Neutral is seven. It is more than seven, so it is basic, slightly basic. Right, slightly basic. Hmm. That is sour. This is salty. Yeah. So, huh. So now the thing is, your blood can change pH. It can become less than seven also. If it becomes less than seven, that means it becomes acidic. Acidic. Above seven is alkaline. Below seven is acidic. So when does your blood become al acidic? When does it become below seven? Why does it become below seven? What makes it below seven? See, everything that you eat becomes your blood. Are you all aware of that? Yes. Everything you eat goes into your blood. So it becomes your blood. So you need to be careful of what you eat. You eat junk, that junk becomes your blood. Correct. So what food makes your blood acidic? No, chewing gum just comes out like that only. It doesn't get absorbed. It's rubber. Before you, before we talk about what makes your blood acidic, is it good to have acidic blood or alkaline blood? It is good to have alkaline blood. Okay, acidic blood is a good environment for bacteria to grow. Okay, so you should always try to keep your blood alkaline. Then you'll avoid getting diseases. If your blood is acidic, very high chance to get sick. Any bacteria comes, they'll be happy in the blood. They'll like, oh, acidic blood, let me live over here, and you'll become sick. So what makes your blood acidic? It is protein, animal protein, which means if you eat non-veg, your blood becomes more acidic. If you eat vegetarian food, your blood becomes more alkaline. Is that clear? All right. So continuing functions of the blood. Okay, first one is transport by the blood. What all is transported by the blood? We already spoke about this in the beginning. So we'll just see the points over here. First is food. Food, right? Food from the intestines and stomach. It is transported to every cell in the body. So what is the food? Your food digests to form glucose, amino acids, vitamins, minerals, salts, etc. These are all the digested food that we eat. Glucose is from carbohydrates. Amino acids is from proteins. Vitamins and minerals. Vitamins are certain substances. Minerals are certain ions like calcium, potassium. All the metals and non-metals. They, they come under minerals. And then there's also fats. Okay, they didn't mention fats here. Then transport of oxygen. From where to where? Oxygen is transported from the lungs to every cell. Now what carries this oxygen in the blood? What in the blood carries oxygen? Hemoglobin, okay. Hemoglobin is a pigment which is present on your RBCs. RBCs have hemoglobin and that hemoglobin attaches itself with oxygen. See the reaction is given over here. When hemoglobin comes in contact with oxygen, it forms oxyhemoglobin, HbO2. And then this HbO2 goes around. If it finds a cell that needs oxygen, what does it do? It gives away that oxygen. This HbO2 is not a stable compound. It's an unstable compound. If it was stable, what would happen? It will not give away the oxygen. It will keep it with itself. So it is an unstable compound. That's why it's able to give away that oxygen to anyone who needs that oxygen. Is that clear, Raman? Yes. Now at the same time, it gives the oxygen. It takes in carbon dioxide. So HB can also attach itself with carbon dioxide and form what? Carbamino hemoglobin. This is also an unstable compound. So when it comes to the lungs, it sees that okay there is less carbon dioxide in the lungs it gives away the carbon dioxide see all this is diffusion the attaching of oxygen giving of oxygen attaching of carbon dioxide giving out is all diffusion diffusion means what movement from highly concentrated to low concentration right so when your blood comes to the lungs and we take in air the air contains around 21 percent oxygen right and your blood will contain around 17 percent oxygen so diffusion takes place oxygen is transferred from where there is more oxygen to where there is less oxygen that is how oxygen enters into your lungs same way when the blood comes back to your lungs there is more carbon dioxide in the lungs there's more carbon dioxide in the lungs and there's less carbon dioxide in the air that came in and so the blood will release the carbon dioxide into the air okay so it's just simple diffusion that uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide are being absorbed and given out same in plants also 
roots absorption of this thing everything is uh, natural process diffusion osmosis then transport of excretory materials that is from the kidney liver they excrete all the waste and they throw it outside of the body right? so that's all in the blood all the waste is in the blood as the blood passes through the kidney what does the kidney do with that waste filters it out throws the waste then distribution of heat this is another important topic how distribution of heat if blood stops flowing have you ever taken a rubber band and tied it on your finger what happens it becomes yeah purplish and have you ever felt it maybe touched on your lips how is it it's cold so your body lost heat so circulation of the blood keeps the body warm when a person dies immediately you see that the person becomes cold because there is no circulation so there is no heat going into the body when you're feeling very cold your heart will beat fast to to keep the body warm and also there are some mechanisms which will prevent your body from losing that heat okay all right um, we'll see till this point here protection by blood how does your blood protect your body see outside the body there are a lot of germs if those germs enter into your body you can get sick okay so suppose you get a cut through that cut germs can enter inside how can your body prevent those germs from entering inside your body a clot is formed as soon as you get a cut within a few minutes a clot is formed that clot seals two things the blood from coming out and also germs from going inside okay also suppose germs enter into your body either through food or through the cut then we have a second layer of second stage of mechan uh, second second mechanism of um, killing that germs that enter inside that is wbcs right your wbcs fight against the germs they engulf the germs engulf means what they'll create like pseudopodia like amoeba and they will capture the germs and then destroy the germs from inside the wbc so that is one thing it does another thing that the our wbcs itself can do is it can release antitoxins or antibodies which will neutralize or destroy the germs once it enters into your body okay so you have like three layers of protection over here first layer is form a clot so it doesn't enter inside but suppose it enters then wbcs can engulf them or what their wbcs can also do is it can create antitoxins or antibodies okay all right so read through this much keep reading ahead also try to study the chapter before i teach itself if you can you know biology is easy you can just read 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 and you should understand okay all right we will stop with this and we'll continue with next class biology and maths okay get biology get maths get chemistry also we need to start electrolysis i have metallurgy which chapter metallurgy, metallurgy first no, electrolysis. electrolysis okay so bio maths and uh, chemistry in the next class tomorrow tomorrow there is class you'll come no tomorrow no no online, online you'll come okay all right see you all bye So 8.5 is the composition of the blood. What is the blood made up of? So the blood has some liquid part and some solid part. The solid part, okay, the liquid part is called the plasma. It's the fluid part which has some dissolved substances also present in it. The dissolved substances are also part of the liquid. Because when something is dissolved means it's part of the liquid. Right? Okay, so that's that's plasma which is 55 to 60 percent of the blood. and the cellular elements is 40 to 45 which is the rbcs wbc and platelets three uh, cellular elements okay so let's see what the plasma is made up of the plasma is mostly water 90 to 92% is water 78% is the dissolved proteins then 1% is the inorganic salts means minerals inorganic salts is like sodium potassium calcium those are the inorganic substances and other substances in traces So, what are the inorganic salts? Sodium chloride, sodium bicarbonate. Sodium chloride is this NaCl salt that we eat, and also there are many other uh, minerals also dissolved in this in the blood. Among other substances contained in the plasma, what are these other substances? Oh, glucose, amino acids, fibrinogen, hormones, urea. So, all that is taking up so less space. Just traces. Okay, glucose is like whatever we eat. 
whatever we eat gets dissolved in the blood right that all that makes up only 1% of your blood okay when we think like okay all the food that we eat is going into the blood but all the food is only 1% of the blood not even 1% traces yeah glucose is from what carbohydrates amino acids is from proteins fibrinogen it helps in clotting of the blood hormones from the endocrine no sorry what yeah endocrine glands and urea is a waste product that is uh, drained out by the kidney urea is one of the nitrogenous wastes how do we get nitrogen do we breathe in nitrogen from the air and that's how we get nitrogen now how do we get nitrogen urea uric acid ammonia these three are the nitrogenous wastes because they contain nitrogen how did these wastes form like how how are we getting in nitrogen for these wastes to be formed it's from proteins okay proteins have nitrogen in them now if you remove all the fibrinogen fibrinogen is the clotting factor what helps the blood to clot if you remove all the fibrin fibrinogen from the plasma what do you get you get a substance called serum so what is present in the serum is what all is there in the serum the inorganic salts are there other substances are there water is there and also there is antibodies see have you heard of taking horse serum serum institute you know we have serum institute yeah. they are they are known for making vaccines so what is this serum or where do we use serum is to get antibodies for example you get disease you get bitten by a snake sometimes and these poisons are inside your body or germs or some and pathogen is inside your body and if your body is not able to produce the antibodies to fight against these pathogens they will get these antibodies made from another animal or now they do it in the lab also they can make these antibodies but say from a horse they will inject these poisons into the horse or these pathogens into the horse the horse will produce the antibodies so they'll take the antibodies from the horse and they will inject into us now they can't take the horse blood and put into us there is will become horse right no we'll die okay because there are uh, subst substances in the blood that cannot be mixed right uh, there is so many things so what they do is they take out all the solid parts that means they take off all the cellular elements and from the plasma also they take off all the protein fibrinogen yeah all the fibrinogen protein okay and then what you get is serum that serum can be injected into our body without any harm so that serum will contain what all these antibodies and so we get those antibodies and it saves us kills the pathogens okay so now cellular elements so there's rbc's wbc and platelets what's the function of rbc also known as erythrocytes what's its function oxygen who give oxygen yeah carrying oxygen so rbc's contain a pigment called hemoglobin Hemoglobin. Yeah, this is how RBC looks. It's biconcave. Means both the sides it is inward concave. All right. This is if you take a cross section of a RBC. This is how it looks. RBCs don't have so many of the cell organelles. No nucleus. No mitochondria. No endoplasmic reticulum. Okay. And there's a good reason why it doesn't have all these three. it is yeah we will we'll see that okay so what are the three cell organelles that are not there in rbcs no nucleus no endoplasmic reticulum no mitochondria okay we'll see why or why is it good not to have these cell organelles okay anyway so what is the size the size is very small you know the biggest is wbc then rbcs are much smaller and platelets are even smaller okay so the size is very small about 7 micron micron means micrometer which is 10 raised to minus 6 of a meter now because it is small you know 
since the nucleus is absent the cell is like this flat if nucleus is there what had happened to the cell it would have become round like this okay now what is the advantage of being so flat can pass through the smallest capillaries it can even uh, no actually the there is more surface area so when it is flatted inside no there is more surface and more surface means more ability to absorb oxygen also yeah the small size helps them to pass through the fine capillaries yeah. capillaries are so narrow that they are so narrow that RBCs have to go one by one only that much space is there they can't even hold hands and go two by two right because there is no gap the size of a capillary is thinner than your hair right how much are how many rbcs do we have 5 million in male and 4.5 million in female that many rbcs in the whole body not in the whole body no, in one cube millimeter cube blood, blood. yeah one millimeter cube you know how much is millimeter cube in that much space you have 5 million rbcs okay you can imagine the size of rbcs how small they are and if they have to go one by one through a capillary how small the capillaries okay Okay, so yeah, you can understand the size from that. So what is this hemoglobin now? So it is the chemical constant of the R of, that's present in the RBC. The red blood cells have colorless spongy body or stroma which contains a respiratory pigment hemoglobin. Right, so it is inside the RBCs that this hemoglobin is present. Hemin is iron and globin is a protein part. So it's made up of iron and protein. Hemoglobin can combine with oxygen to form oxyhemoglobin, which is an unstable compound. Okay, because it is unstable, oxygen is readily given away to any cell that needs that oxygen. If it was a stable compound, this oxygen and hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin, if it was stable, what would be the problem? It would never give away the oxygen to anyone, any cell. Now hemoglobin can attach itself with oxygen, it can attach itself with carbon dioxide it can also also attach itself with carbon monoxide it should never attach itself with carbon monoxide why it forms a stable compound okay yeah and because it's a stable compound it never gives away that carbon monoxide and then there's no place for carbon dioxide i mean there's no place for oxygen so carbon monoxide poisoning is something that you should know what it is if you close your rooms, cut off the air supply, like in cold places, and if you light a fire inside your room, the fire will consume all the oxygen in the room. And then since you close the window, there is no more oxygen entering inside. And when fire burns in the presence of oxygen, it releases carbon dioxide. But when a fire is trying to burn in the absence of oxygen, it will release carbon monoxide. So whenever fire is burnt, you should always have good supply of oxygen into the room. Carbon dioxide released is okay, it's not poisonous, but if carbon monoxide is released, that is poisonous because it attaches itself with hemoglobin. So what are the names of these compounds formed? If oxygen attaches with hemoglobin, what do you get? Huh? Oxygen. Hemoglobin. What if carbon dioxide attaches with hemoglobin? Carbamino hemoglobin. And what about carbon monoxide plus hemoglobin? What do you get? Carbox. Not carbaminol, carboxyhemoglobin. Write on this. Okay. So, uh, when the hemoglobin goes to your lungs, it absorbs all this oxygen, right? And now the hemoglobin in, in your blood is 97 to 99% saturated with oxygen. Like almost all the hemoglobin is filled with oxygen. Now once this hemoglobin goes around with the blood and gives away all this oxygen, it doesn't give away full 100%, 97% of its oxygen and the oxygen doesn't become 0% of the hemoglobin. 
it gives only some of it and the blood in the veins which you think doesn't have oxygen actually still has 75 percent oxygen okay that's why the air that we breathe out is not zero percent oxygen you know the air that we breathe out has so much oxygen in it see what is the percentage of oxygen in the air air how much what is the percentage of oxygen in the air huh 21 percent what is the percentage of oxygen in the air that we breathe out that's too less 17 okay it's only one percent but up to three to four percent of the oxygen gets absorbed into the body and the air that we breathe out still has 17 percent oxygen that's why when you give cpr no you're not giving full carbon dioxide to the person when you're blowing air you're giving oxygen there's oxygen going inside okay when you blow into a candle slowly not so fast that it goes off but the fire actually becomes brighter that's because there is oxygen in the air that you breathe out yeah Okay, guys, rejoin the meeting. Okay, now this point is important here. RBCs are deficient, but it is more efficient. It's deficient in three things. No nucleus, no endoplasmic reticulum, no mitochondria. But because it doesn't have these three things, it is more efficient, better. How is it more efficient? So since it does not have nucleus, see, this is how the RBCs would have looked if it had nucleus. It would be a little bigger. But because it doesn't have nucleus, there is more space in between the RBCs and because of more space, more RBCs can be accommodated. So that's the advantage of having no nucleus. Next, what is the advantage of not having mitochondria? What is mitochondria? Powerhouse of the cell. Why do we call it the powerhouse of the cell? Yeah, respiration. The reaction respiration takes place in the mitochondria. In respiration, what is used and what is produced? In respiration, what is used up? Oxygen. Oxygen. And energy is produced. So if the RBC has had mitochondria, it would have used up the oxygen. It's carrying oxygen. For itself or for others? Who is it carrying oxygen for? For other cells. If the RBC has had mitochondria, what would have happened? They only would they only would have used up the oxygen, right? So so good they don't have mitochondria, so that they don't use up the oxygen that it's carrying. Next, endoplasmic reticulum. What is the function of endoplasmic reticulum? You had the first chapter, no? Huh? Bye bye. That is if it doesn't have. I'm saying what is the use of endoplasmic reticulum? Okay, that's their connection, but there's another purpose also. Supportive framework. Do you remember that point? Yeah. Endoplasmic reticulum provided a supportive framework for the cell. Means it held the cell from inside, so the cell would not compress. It will. It's like like a skeleton from inside. So because there's no endoplasmic reticulum, the cell is more flexible and bendable and twistable, and that way it is able to move through the narrow capillaries easily. Okay, so because the cell doesn't have these three cell organelles, it becomes more efficient. A very important question. All right. Um, yeah, actually, we'll stop with this. Okay, we'll see WBCs in the next class because there are so many different types of WBCs. All right. How much of the chapter is done in school? So last class we saw about RBCs. What is the main function of the RBC? Yeah. Carrying oxygen. Yeah. What is that pigment that it has which ca carries this oxygen? Yeah. Hemoglobin. Now the second uh, cellular particles or cells present in the cell is the WBC. What is another word for WBC? Yeah. Leukocytes. Now leukocytes are much bigger in size compared to the RBCs and so they are much lesser in number. In per millimeter cube, you just have 4,000 to 8,000 uh, WBCs. What is the function of WBCs? Yes, it's for fighting germs, fighting pathogens. It can fight it in two ways. One is by... Yeah, that is called... What is that called? It's called phagocytosis. Write on that word phagocytos phagocytosis.
done writing okay so phagocytosis is one of the way they destroy their germs they engulf it another way how they destroy it is they release antibodies okay and these antibodies will remain in the blood and will destroy the germs so it's not the same wbc that does both of it there are different types of wbcs you know how many types of wbcs are there five five Okay, here they are neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils. Those are the fills. And then there's lymphocyte and monocyte. They are the sites. Okay, so three fills and two sites. The fills they have granules inside of them. Do you see them? They have these particles inside them. So they are called granulocytes. So three granulocytes, and two of them don't have granules. They are called agranulocytes. A granular site or yeah non granular both okay so you have a table over here showing the three granular sites and the two non granular granular sites now from this two of them are very abundant the first one that is neutrophil is they they are they may around 62% of all the wbcs are neutrophils and in non granular sites lymphocytes are the most abundant they are around 30% you see so these two itself make around 92% of all the wbcs okay so just remember these two and what are their functions so neutrophils function is what phagocytosis you see that engulf bacteria 62% of the wbcs are neutrophil and they engulf the bacteria and guess what the remaining 30% lymphocytes do what what do they do produce antibodies right because these are the two main things that they do right so these are the two wbcs that perform 92 cover 92% of the wbcs and do those functions see lymphocytes are the smallest of wbcs and they have a large single nucleus monocyte is the largest of the wbc their nucleus is kidney shaped they also ingest germs ingest the same like engulfing like phagocytosis Okay, so that's about the WBCs. Now, how long do they live? Their lifespan is, huh? No, two weeks only. Okay, WBCs are also created and destroyed, just like the RBCs are done. RBC, you know what lives forever in your body? I mean, which cells? Huh? What? Neurons. Nerve cells, yeah, the nerve cells, neurons. They last your whole life. Okay, but all the other cells in your body they die. I think your eyes also last, eye size or something stays the same your whole life or something they say. Okay, yeah, but everything else in your body keeps dying and being formed every okay after a few days or months. Yeah, so WBCs are much lesser in number, they last only for two weeks. I mean, that's average. See, neutrophils they live only a few hours. Which is neutrophil? That's sixty-two percent. They only live for a few hours because engulfing bacteria. You know, you can think of it like this: they die in that process, engulf, and sometimes they die. So they die very fast. Just think of it that way. Neutrophils. Now there are two diseases based on the number of WBCs. One is leukemia. Leukemia is when the number of WBCs increase too many times. Now is that good? It's good, no? Too many WBCs, so more protection. The problem is what? If there's too many WBCs. How is it a problem if there's too many WBCs? Huh? They take up all the space. Then there's no space for RBC. RBCs also have to be there, no, to carry oxygen. So that's the problem. If there's too many WBCs, then there's no place for RBCs. So that is a cancer called leukemia. The only treatment is remove old blood, put new blood. Blood transfusion has to be done. There's another opposite of that called leukopenia. Leukopenia is when there's an abnormal decrease in the number of RBCs. What's the problem if there's too less RBCs? Yeah, no, in, no immunity. You'll get sick very fast because your body is not having WBC to fight against the germs.
So functions of the WBC, we saw two functions. One was phagocytosis to ingest the germs and one was formation of antibodies that will destroy the germs. There's one more function here that is, what is that? Inflammation. Inflammation is what? See, when you get hurt somewhere, that area becomes red, it becomes warm, it becomes swollen. That is inflammation. When, when does inflammation happen? When you get hurt. Correct. Alright, so let's read this. Inflammation occurs due to the reaction of tissues to injury and to localized invasion of germs. The inflamed spot has several characters. What happens when you have inflammation? There is local heat. It's warm. It becomes red. There is swelling and there is pain. Here are the leukocytes, especially the monocytes and neutrophils. Monocytes and neutrophils. What is the speciality about these two? Monocytes and neutrophils. Engulfing bacteria. So they go over there. Okay, how do they go there? They are inside the, inside the blood vessels, no? How do they go to the inflamed area? Huh? They squeeze out of the blood vessels and they come out. That squeezing out of the blood vessel also has a name. It's called diapedesis. See, this is a picture of how diapedesis takes place. The WBC has this amoeboid type of movement. You know, it can create this false feet. What is that false feet called? Pseudopodia. In amoeba, they create a false feet called pseudopodia. So it can create this false feet and it can squeeze itself through the walls of the walls of the capillaries. The small blood vessels, that is capillaries. It can't squeeze itself out of the big blood vessels like veins and arteries, only through the capillaries. So it squeezes its way out and comes out and goes to the surrounding cells where there is inflammation and there it goes and engulfs the bacteria, whatever is there. Okay. So write down this meaning of this word diapedesis. Okay, done? Yeah, so whenever there's an inflamed area where there's some bacterial infection or something, who are these soldiers who run and go there? Which two? The ones that engulf them, that is? neutrophils and monocytes they go there they squeeze their way outside through the walls of the capillaries go there to that area and then they start engulfing all those bacteria okay what happens to these dead wbcs the ones that die that becomes pus you know whenever you have a bacterial infection you get pus have you ever had it no that's good that you didn't have it that means you never had an infection See, if you have an infection, normally we go and take antibiotics, no? But if you don't take antibiotics and the infection increases, you will have pus coming out of that place where there is some cut or something. That pus is actually what? The dead WBCs. Okay? Have you seen what color pus is? No? It's like cream. Yeah, yellowish, creamish things that will ooze out of your skin. Okay, it's very yuck, it stinks. That is the pus because that's there's already an infection. Bacteria is fighting. Bacteria is winning. That's why WBCs are dying. Okay, so that's not a good sign if there is pus. Okay, the last blood cells are the platelets, also called as thrombocytes. Okay, now what's the function of the platelets? Clotting of blood. The platelets are very tiny. If you look at the picture over here, they have shown platelets to be very, very small. Okay. So how do the platelets clot? Okay, so there are many steps. Okay. So uh, oh, one thing I forgot to tell you is where is the WBC produced and destroyed? So they are produced in red bone marrow, same like the RBCs, but also in the lymph nodes and sometimes even in the liver and spleen. Now RBCs are produced in the liver and spleen only for as an embryo, no? Yesterday we saw only in the, in the embryo, uh, RBCs are produced in the liver and spleen. But WBCs are produced in the liver and spleen through, throughout your life. Okay, where are they destroyed? Same like the RBC. Where all? Spleen, liver and 
बोल मैं रहा हूँ सी वेर दी आरबीसी इज डिस्टर्ड स्प्लीन लिवर एंड बोन मैरो इवन द डब्ल्यू बी सीज आर डिस्टर्ड इन द सेम थ्री प्लेसेस ओके कमन प्लेटलेट्स देयर लाइफ स्पैन इज जस्ट थ्री टू फाइव डेज के देयर ऑल्सो सी वॉट प्रोड्यूस दैम दे आर प्रोड्यूस्ड फ्रॉम द रेड बोन मैरो इट्सल्फ देर आर सम जॉइंट सेल्स कॉल मेगा कैरियोसाइट्स दे आर दंस एर प्रोड्यूस दीज प्लेटलेट्स ओके ना वॉट्स द नंबर ऑफ प्लेटलेट्स Two lakh to four lakh per cubic millimeter, little less than the RBCs. RBCs are four point five. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's million. Million means one, one more zero is there. That means forty five lakhs to fifty lakhs. This is two lakh to four lakh. So much lesser than RBCs. So they are minute oval or round structures, mm-hmm. non-nucleated, floating in the blood. This is a number. This is where they are produced. Where are they destroyed? Destroyed mainly in the spleen, and they are used during clotting of blood. Okay. So let us see the steps involved in clotting of blood. Okay. There are some three, four steps. You have to memorize these steps. All right. So first thing, when you get a cut, when is a clot formed? First of all, huh? When there's, when there's injury. When cells are destroyed, right? When there is an injury. to what happened why laughing okay injury only during injury or is there any other time that's a clot that a clot is formed ha huh? how do people get heart attack yeah so when there's too much fat content inside the blood vessels the blood vessel is not smooth from inside it is rough okay and when it is rough and the blood flows through those rough surface clots can form see clots can form even if just passing through any rough surface it will think it's some injury and it's rough and it just forms that clot and that clot can travel through your blood vessels and sometimes it can get stuck in some small blood vessels and it will form a blockage if that blockage happens in your heart that is what is a heart attack okay so that uh, that fat content can be formed anywhere right if it forms in your heart then your blood vessels become narrow and if there's a clot it won't be able to pass through that blood vessel smooth then it can form a blockage okay so let us see the steps that uh, takes place whenever you get an injury So first thing is the platelets will get disintegrated when you get damaged I mean hurt somewhere those platelets get broken down and when they break down they release a substance called what is that word injured platelets release what is the word thrombokinase or thrombokinase okay thrombokinase thrombokinase is also called as thromboplastin it's also called as factor x or it's also called as stuart factor so four names okay so this substance is released whenever there is a injury now what this thromboplastin or thrombokinase does it joins with calcium and it converts a substance prothrombin into thrombin so this prothrombin is a substance that is already present in the plasma of the blood it's an inactive substance that becomes get converted into thrombin So what's the second point, Ahmed? Prothrombin gets converted into thrombin. Who helps this conversion? Thrombokinase. 
along with calcium ions 2 plus the two together will convert prothrombin to thrombin so prothrombin was an inactive substance it becomes active and what does this active substance do this active substance will convert another substance fibrinogen into fibrin now fibrinogen was a soluble substance it was dissolved in the blood it will become fibrin fibrin is like fiber it is insoluble so this insoluble fibrin it's like thread like structures they will go at the place of the block i'll say it once again when there is injury the platelets disintegrate is they get destroyed and in the process of getting destroyed it releases the substance called thrombokinase now thrombokinase reacts with calcium in the blood and converts prothrombin it doesn't react with prothrombin you said it reacts it converts the inactive prothrombin which is already there in the plasma and it converts that prothrombin into thrombin it's an active substance now this active substance it again reacts with more calcium to convert fibrinogen which is another substance present in the plasma that is a soluble substance it is just dissolved in the blood that is converted into fibrin which is an insoluble thread like structure not solid thread and this thread like structure will go and block the cut and as blood is oozing out through that it will get blocked in that mesh and the clot is formed is that clear it goes to the see these microscopic threads there fibrin they are sticky and they form a network like a mesh at the wound and then blood cells get trapped in that network and uh, they get stuck over there and that's how a clot is formed and the blood is not allowed to come outside after the see i'll read this last part blood cells are trapped in the network of the fibrin the network then shrinks and squeezes out the rest of the plasma which is in the form of a clear liquid called serum the solid mass which is left behind is called the clot or thrombus so from the blood all the cells that is platelets rbcs wbc all of them get stuck in that mesh and what comes out of the mesh is only the liquid part which liquid part the plasma but from the plasma also your whole plasma doesn't come out only the serum comes out serum is if you take out what all the soluble substances from the plasma you get serum we saw serum in the last class i think see what is serum the plasma from which all the protein fibrinogen has been removed is called serum so only serum comes out after you get a clot you will see some clear liquid outside that is the serum serum is almost transparent plasma is slightly yellowish in color done now some people used to think previously that blood clot only happens when the blood is exposed to the air so they used to think there's a cut and the blood comes out it's ex exposed to the air and that's how the clot is formed but they tried out some experiments and they saw that see uh, you don't need exposure to air for a clot to form if you just as i said if the blood just moves over a rough surface a clot can form right See here, if you just take some blood outside and leave it, it won't stay as a blood forever. It will clot. Again, that's not just because of exposure to air. Yeah. So, I mean, blood has to be inside your body and moving smoothly, continuously. Then the clot will not form. If it is stationary, clot will form. If it is passing through rough surface, clot will form. Okay. So here it is stationary. That's why the clot is formed. So clot is the all the cells, all the cells of the blood, and what is remaining is. the serum what is hemophilia we studied genetics in that we studied about hemophilia do you remember what's hemophilia yes. what's that hmm huh? hmm what is saying hemophilia is the inability of blood to clot it cannot clot so even if you get cut one clot so what's going to happen then Yeah, blood will keep flowing out. Person can even die with a small cut if he has hemophilia. Now, hemophilia is a genetic disorder. And what did we study about? It is what type of genetic disorder? Which chromosome is 
affected if you have hemophilia it's just like color blindness it affects the x x chromosome right color blindness affects which chromosome x or y what is male have x y right female is x x correct so if it affects the x it means it can affect the female also but for the female to get affected with the disease both the x chromosomes have to be affected if only one of the x chromosome is affected they'll just be a carrier for male how it is they have only one x if their x is affected they get the disease right no it's like color blindness it affects the x chromosome what is the two diseases that affect the y chromosome pattern baldness baldness being bald in the head over here that that affects the y chromosome so only, only male can get that disease female cannot get it because they don't have y chromosome right so uh, x chromosome diseases by color blindness and hemophilia why dis why why linked in inheritance or why chromosome diseases were pattern baldness and hair in the ears these are these can only affect male okay ah uh, so much okay anyway uh, we'll just see the blood uh, blood types also what are the different blood blood groups okay so why all these different blood groups it's because of certain antigen present on the rbcs so there are, they have found three types of antigens in human beings one is the antigen a one is the antigen b and one is the antigen rh these are the three antigens that are possible that you can have on your blood if you have the a antigen then your blood group is a if you have the b then your blood group is b if you have both the antigens your blood group is ab if you don't have both the antigens then your blood group is o okay and this rh is another thing they found out later on it's called the rh factor and if you have the rh factor then your blood group is positive if you don't have rh factor then your blood group is negative okay so i'll mark you tell me what's the blood group suppose i have a and rh then what's my blood group a positive if i have b and a ab negative if you have all three a b and rh ab positive do you understand so tell me which all antigens you have in your blood a and rh a and rh so what's this blood group a positive what is yours a and rh you a and rh you huh all three so you're ab positive like my dad and you RH. only rh i'm o positive oh you're o positive yeah so you are o positive that means you only have the rh antigen you understand what if you don't have any of the antigens then what's your blood group yeah my mom is also o positive i am b positive okay all right so now uh, it's like this if you have a certain antigen then you will have antibodies against the other antigens okay i'll say that once again if you have a certain antigen in your blood then you will have antibodies against other antigens what is the meaning of antigen what's antibodies antibodies fight against antigens antigens don't fight who fights antibodies antibodies will fight against antigens so if a person has antigen a in his blood then he'll have he'll have antibodies that will fight against whom b and rh if you have if the person has these two antigens then he'll have antibodies against negative rh yeah if a person has all the three antigens then he'll not have any antibodies means he won't fight against anyone did you understand this is very i mean important if you get this much then you can understand who can donate and who can receive blood okay now what if a person has only antigen a then he'll have antibodies means he'll fight against b and rh so he cannot take a person who is giving b blood group or positive blood group it will fight okay what if a person has all these three antigens 
then he has no antibodies he won't fight against a he won't fight against b he won't fight against the positive so he can take blood from anyone that's why ab positive is a universal recipient he can take blood from anyone what if a person has is o negative that means no antigens then he has antibodies against a b and rh it will fight against a it will fight against b antigen it will fight against rh antigen so it cannot take any of those antigens it has to take o negative blood only if a person has this antigen his blood group is b negative whose all blood can he take he can take b negative obviously and o negative because o negative has no antigens you understand this person here what antibodies does he have antibodies against a and antibodies against rh means he will fight a a group blood and he will fight the positive blood so it can only take blood which does not have antigen a and antigen rh that means he can take a person who has only antigen b or who doesn't have any antigen if a person has only antigen b his blood group is b negative if he doesn't have any antigen then his blood group is o negative so you can take from b negative and o negative do you understand clear is it clear or not okay so again the simple thing is what antigen is a is a substance that is on the rbcs it's attached on the rbcs an antibody is a substance that is floating in the plasma who fights against whom antibodies, antibodies fight against antigens this antigen why is it called rhs because it was found in a monkey called rhesus monkey that's where they first found the rh factor or the rh antigen what okay let's see what happens if a person takes the wrong blood group that is not supposed to take okay look the blood of most people contains a substance called rh factor when the blood of such an individual who has positive is transfused into a person who does not have this rh factor that's into the negative blood the blood of the recipient the one who receives he develops an antibody for rh substance so a person who has negative blood group he doesn't have rh right that means he has antibodies a person who has rh antigen will have antibodies only against b and a but if a person doesn't have rh then he'll have antibodies against that rh also right correct so imagine somebody you say you're o negative that means you have no antigens but what you have is antibodies against a b and rh now suppose a person say your blood group is some positive so if your blood is donated your blood has antigen rh antigen and you have antibodies that will fight against that rh so your blood gets sensitized it's called sensitized means your body will create those antibodies to fight that rh substance within about 2 weeks of transfusion after 2 weeks in the 2 weeks time it will produce these uh, antibodies so antibodies are not there in the beginning antibodies are produced if that blood is taken in okay what we saw is i said it contains antibodies no it doesn't contain but antibodies will be produced if that antigen is introduced into that person's blood now that antibody is there means it's waiting to fight against that blood so the second time if a blood is transfused see now if a second transfusion is given to that person then the antibodies that were created will do what it will cause a reaction with the blood that was transfused and which can lead to death so the first time if blood is given nothing will happen but that will trigger the body to create these antibodies and then a second time if those antigens come into your body then the antibodies will cause a reaction against those antigens and cause uh, some reaction which can lead to death what about pregnancy if the mother is negative and the child born is positive then the mother's blood gets sensitized means a second baby that is born can kill the mother because the mother's blood is already sensitized but this only happens if the blood is mixed okay otherwise nothing will happen which is a very rare occurrence 
See, the first Rh positive child will be normal, but if it sensitizes the mother, if it sensitizes, means if the baby's blood gets mixed with the mother, does it always get mixed, baby's blood and mother's blood? No, it doesn't get mixed because there is, what's it called? Placenta. The placenta will is creating a division between the mother's blood and the child's blood. Only the nutrients get transferred, the blood does not get transferred. So, there is no harm normally. But suppose the blood gets transferred, then it sensitizes the mother and the first child will be born normal. But if the second child who is born positive, then sometimes there will be a problem which could even lead to the death of the child or even the mother. Uh, that's the end of this first part of the chapter. 8.7 is done. Next you'll be learning about the heart. Okay, so heart and the blood vessels, the difference between arteries and veins and the lymph. So that is the last part of the chapter. That's the important part. Alright, so your heart is divided into four chambers. This is the right ventricle, right auricle, then this is the left auricle, then here right ventricle and the left ventricle. From the lungs, oxygenated blood enters into the left auricle. Okay, then from the left auricle, the blood goes into the left ventricle. Okay, we are just seeing the direction of the blood flow throughout the heart. Then we will see the names of all these vessels. Okay, next from the ventricles, the blood exits out and goes to the whole body. Now this blood that's going out to the whole body is oxygenated blood. It goes to the whole body, supplies oxygen to every cell in the body and then the blood vessel comes back into the... Where does it come back? Into the right auricle. Then from the right auricle the blood goes into the right ventricle. From the right ventricle where does the blood go? Now this blood is oxygenated or deoxygenated blood? Deoxygenated blood. Okay, so that blood goes where now? Into the lungs for oxygenation. Okay, tell me everyone, from lungs the blood comes into left auricle, then it goes into left ventricle, then the blood goes to all parts of the body and then the blood comes back to the heart where Right auricle, then from right auricle, right ventricle, then from right ventricle to the lungs. Okay, so this is the whole circulation of the blood. So there are two circulations. One circulation is between the heart and the lungs, that is called the pulmonary circulation. The word pulmonary means lungs, anything to do with lungs is called pulmonary. So one circulation between the lungs and the heart is called pulmonary circulation. And the second circulation is the main one which goes to the whole body and comes back to the heart. That is called systemic circulation. Okay, so what are the two types of circulations? What are those two words? The circulation pulmonary. to the lungs is called pulmonary circulation. Pulmonary circulation. Not systematic. What is it? Pulmonary. Yeah, pulmonary and the other one? Systematic. Not systematic. Systemic. Just systemic. Okay. So since there are two circulations, the circulation in human beings is called double circulation. Is that clear? Okay. Now look at the names. Now arteries and veins, any blood that leaves the heart is leaving through an artery. Okay. Arteries are very thick, their walls are very strong because the blood that is leaving the heart is under so much pressure. The heart is pumping with so much pressure, right? So the arteries have very thick walls. They are able to withstand this high pressure exerted by the heart. Okay, so the blood goes through a artery. Now the artery will break into smaller arterioles. Artery splits into what? Arterioles. Artery, arterioles are like small arteries. Then the arterioles will again split into smaller blood vessels called capillaries. Then capillaries now are very tiny, right? Thinner than your hair. They will rejoin to form what am I? They will rejoin to form something called venules. Venues are like tiny veins. And then the venules will also rejoin to form the final veins. Okay, so this is the uh, path taken by the blood through the blood uh, vessels. Arteries and veins are the biggest blood vessels. Okay, there is a very different uh, 
structure of them like artery we saw they have very thick walls so that they can withstand the high pressure veins their walls are not very thin arteries carry the blood away from the heart veins carry the blood back to the heart mostly which direction is the blood flowing through the artery downwards or upwards no. downwards because your heart is mostly on the upper part i mean it's on the upper part of the body so the blood through the artery is mostly going downwards it's going towards gravity okay the veins are bringing the blood back up to the heart so there is a very high chance that the blood in the veins could go backwards first of all due to gravity second of all because there is less pressure in the veins artery has a lot of pressure because heart is pumping and that pressure keeps decreasing as it goes into capillaries and by the time it turns into venules and veins there is no pressure in the blood the blood is just simply flowing because of that blood coming in from behind so it's just flowing so there is a very high chance that the blood in the veins could go backwards this is the direction blood is supposed to come upwards to the heart but it could go backwards so to prevent the blood from going backwards we have one mechanism what mechanism is that valves there are valves in the veins veins have valves remember vv okay what do the valves do yeah, they prevent the back flow of blood right okay so blood blood can only go in one direction okay next we'll look at the names of the arteries and the veins so these two over here they are veins or arteries they are arteries they are taking blood away from the heart so what is the name of this right side i mean the left side of the heart what is this artery left pulmonary not pulmonary pulmonary means something to do with the lungs this has nothing to do with the lungs this artery is the biggest artery in the in the body it's called the aorta Okay, aorta is the biggest artery that's taking the blood away from the heart. Now, if you look at the diagram in your book, the artery doesn't go downwards; it goes upwards. Okay, so the artery comes like this from the heart. I mean, from the left ventricle, it goes upwards. Do you see it in your book? See here. This is the left ventricle, but the artery doesn't come out from the side like how I do it. I just do it to understand the direction of the blood flow. Look at the artery. Where is it? here this red color one that's the aorta so it's coming out from the left ventricle but it is going through like this and coming out from top okay all right anyway so that's the aorta uh, taking the blood away from the heart what is this artery now this takes blood away from the heart but it takes it to the lungs so what do you think this will be called it's an artery and it's taking to the lungs so remember i said lungs is called pulmonary so this artery is called pulmonary artery easy name okay the word pulmonary means lungs and since it's an artery it's called the pulmonary artery all right then now let's look at the two veins that bring the blood back to the heart this vein it's bringing blood from the lungs into the heart uh, just let's see if we can answer these questions true or false process of coagulation what is coagulation okay let's see if you read the whole sentence if it makes some sense process of coagulation starts with the release of a substance from the rbcs okay so that's not the meaning of the word coagulation anyone knows what's coagulation coagulation means clotting now tell me the answer coagulation starts with the release of a substance from the rbcs true or false okay so how do you correct the statement not does not that's not how you correct it you have to correct the proper nouns and the words that are there not yes and no no process of coagulation then that's false only no false means no what's the point of changing that yes to no you have to correct the words process of coagulation starts with the release of a substance from platelets new chapter for you where were you man all these days yeah i say why which campus were you What are you doing there? So, enjoy, no? 
No, really, you don't have phone. I don't have phone. Come, Ryan. Hey, late fellows. It's 5:20. It's Friday, it's five o'clock, huh? All right. So write down this word first in your book. Coagulation means clotting. And by the way, how many of you studied the process of the coagulation process? Thrombokinase, fibrinogen to fibrin. The next thing you have to know is about valves. Now there are valves in and around the heart which prevents the backflow of blood. So there are four valves. Between the auricle and the ventricle, there are valves. So on the left side there is a valve. There's, it has two flaps. So it's called a bicuspid valve. Bi means what? Two. And there are two cusps. Cusps are those flaps. So this is a bicuspid valve. And on the right side there are three cusps. Three flaps which prevent the backflow of blood. So that is called what? Tricuspid valve. All right. Then there's also valves at the beginning of the aorta and the beginning of the pulmonary artery. Both these valves are called semilunar valves. Semilunar. Lunar is moon. Semilun is half moon. Okay, I don't know why they're calling it that. But semilunar valves. So the one on the aorta side is called the aortic semilunar valve. And the one on the left side is called pulmonary semilunar valves. Okay, is that clear? These are all the valves and all the arteries and veins are on the heart. This much you should know. After that, small small additions and sub additions are there to this. Okay, uh, I want you to draw this diagram as neatly as you can, neater than what I drew. Okay, put all the names, whatever is there. Shall I ask you? Just let's see how much you know. Okay. Okay. What's a valve at the beginning of the aorta? Beginning of the aorta. Starting of the aorta. Semilunar. What semilunar? Aortic semilunar valves. What's the beginning of the pulmonary artery? Pulmonary semilunar valves. What is a valve in between the right auricle and the right ventricle? Tricuspid. Right is tri. Remember, right tri. Okay, right side has tri. This is right side. Okay, so tricuspid valve. What is the vein that? Okay, what is the largest vein in the body? Maybe, I don't know. Okay, anyway. But what is the vein that brings the blood back from the body? To the heart. To the heart. The vena cava. Okay, superior and inferior vena cava. Where does the superior vena cava bring the blood back from? Mostly from the brain. Upper parts of the body, mostly from the brain. See, on the right, this is left side, this is right side. In between that, no, there is a separation. You know what that separation is called? I have not told it, but anyone knows what it is? Like what separates the heart into the two sides, left and right? That muscular layer in between is called the septum. Was that? What's it called? Ahmed? You're not listening. You both should not sit together. What is that separation? Huh? This one. You see this line that passes through and divides the heart into two parts? It's called the septum. Mark it. How does the heart actually beat? Now, if my hand is representing the heart, okay. On the top, we have the auricles, and at the bottom, we have the ventricles. First, the auricles together they'll pump. Then, the ventricles will pump. When the ventricles pump, the auricles will relax, and then the ventricles also will relax. Again, okay. so. Understand? Auricles contract, ventricles contract, both relax. Auricles contract, ventricles contract, both relax. Three steps. 
What's the first step? Oracle's contract. Second step? Ventricle's contract. Third step? Both relax. Contraction is also called systole. Okay. So we say auricular systole, then ventricular systole, and then relaxing is called diastole. So then there is diastole. Now what is the time taken for each of these? Look here. Auricular systole or systole of the auricle or atria. Atrium is singular. Atria is plural. So that is 0 0.15 seconds. Then systole of the ventricles is 0 0.3 seconds. Double of the this one. And then relaxation. All chambers are in relaxed state. That is 0 0.4 seconds. This total one heartbeat takes around 0 0.85 seconds. Understand? So one heartbeat takes 0 0.85 seconds. So if you want to calculate how many heart, how many beats are there per minute, we have to do 60 seconds divided by 0 0.85, and we get around 70 beats per minute. Okay, that is your heartbeat in a minute, around 70 beats. For male, it is 60 to 72, and for female, it is 72 to 84. Okay, your heart beats faster than our heart beats. Okay. Uh, this actually the reason is like this the smaller the animal the faster the heartbeat the bigger the animal the slower the heartbeat you know that have you ever held a bird in your hand yes. have you felt its heartbeat yes. how is it it will be like one vibration it is why is it so fast oh, it is fast okay I'll tell you why now a big animal like an elephant its heart beats very slowly okay now why why does a small animal's heart beat so fast? Okay, look here. Here, here. Look at this. What? For whom? So why does it have to reach faster? The blood doesn't move very fast. Okay, yeah, yeah. The blood also moves fast. Heart beats faster, the blood moves fast. But why does the blood have to move fast for a small animal? See here, you can see here. A whale, what's the heartbeat of a whale? 15 per minute, 15 beats per minute. Rate of heartbeat, okay? Elephant, 25. Horse, 40. Adult man, 64 to 72. Adult woman, 72 to 80. Cat, 120. Newborn infant, 140. A rat, 250. A sparrow, 800 to 900. You saw that as the animal gets smaller, its heartbeat increases. Rate of heartbeat increases. Any idea why? It's because the smaller the animal, it loses heat faster. The bigger the animal, the heat stays within the body. And uh, circulation of the blood supplies heat to the body. Right? So these smaller animals, since they lose heat so fast, they have to the blood has to pump faster so that it can stay warm. Okay. Also, the smaller animals move faster. Bigger animal moves slowly, slowly. You have noticed that, right? You see now ants, they walk. How fast their legs move? It's like very fast, right? So their body moves fast. So they have very high metabolism. Means energy is getting produced and used up very fast. So blood has to move fast. Also heat is lost very fast. But a big animal, they move very slowly. So there's less energy used and also less heat lost. So because of that, heart beats slowly. Now, have you heard your heartbeat? Yes. Okay, it makes the sound lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. Why the sound is formed? The sound is <coughs> of the valves closing. Okay, so first the auricles contract. That time there's no valve that's closing. Right, the valves, in fact, they're open and all the blood goes into the ventricles. Yeah? Next, the ventricles contract. When the ventricles contract, blood tries to go back into the auricles. But who is blocking it? The valves. And that valves make that first sound that you hear, the lub sound. Lub. So when is the first sound? Is is it when the auricles contract or when the ventricles contract? Ventricles contract. That's the first sound that you hear. And then there is relaxation of both, right? That time, yeah. So when the ventricles contract, the blood did not go into the auricles. Where did it go? Into the the arteries, the two arteries, right? 
from the left ventricle the blood goes into the aorta and from the right ventricle the blood goes into the pulmonary artery now the ventricles will relax when the ventricles relax the blood from the arteries try to go back into the heart so that time these two valves close the semilunar valves they close and they make that second sound the dup sound understand now this is the heart you tell me when the sound is okay any sound all of you say what sound lub then dub as soon as this uh, si uh, di diastole is there and they relax what's diastole oh god what is diastole relax systole is contraction diastole is relaxation okay systole 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 diastole systole no sound ventricular systole lub sound diastole dub sound okay the next topic is the pacemaker you want a pacemaker have you heard of it okay anything about it i remember when i was in school there was one very old uncle he was 90 years old he had a pacemaker so i just think what is his pacemaker so pacemaker is an okay everybody's heart has an inbuilt pacemaker a pacemaker is a device which creates electrical impulses to the heart your heart is a muscle and for the muscles to contract some electricity should be given so this pacemaker is on the heart and it creates these electrical impulses so the heart will pop the heart will uh, contract the muscles will contract that causes the heart to beat okay now what if the pacemaker stops working then your heart will stop beating you understand so your pacemaker is very important it has to keep functioning your whole life you cannot even skip one beat right it has to keep sending these electrical electrical impulses to your heart when a person stops breathing and his heart stops functioning they give shock right that shock is giving electricity to your heart so that the heart muscles can contract you understand so the same type of electricity is already there in your heart is continuously getting these electrical signals and that's why it's pumping okay now a pacemaker is divided into four parts okay the first part of the pacemaker is the main part which is called the san sinoatrial node okay it is located in the walls of the right auricle okay where is the right auricle here so on the walls of the right auricle you have the main part of the pacemaker which is called the sinoatrial node that's where the electrical impulses are generated from it starts over here okay so when the electrical impulses is generated from here both the auricles will contract that's the first impulse that causes the auricles to contract so now pacemaker is a electrical device yes it's already there in everybody's heart yeah and if the pacemaker of your heart stops functioning due to any reason then they will put an external pacemaker in your heart you, they you, they make a pacemaker using a battery and they'll do an operation and they'll put that pacemaker on your heart and they'll connect it to your heart so that that will run as the new pacemaker artificial pacemaker so now if they make it by the battery uh, at one point won't the battery get over do yeah. you have to change it or something yeah so it's a very long lasting battery say it's, it will last for 10 15 years okay and mostly pacemaker gets spoiled the natural pacemaker gets spoiled when a person is very old and mostly it doesn't live another 10 15 years after that okay so the battery lasts for his whole life <laughs> yeah he should If it lasts more than 15 years, then they might have to do something with the battery. Okay, but that's why it's an operation; it's inside, and uh, they can't just change the battery when it finishes easily. By the time they open to change the battery, is already gone, right? So, yeah, it is. Uh, it lasts a long time. They have thought about that. Okay, so the first part of the pacemaker was the SAN <coughs> sinoatrial node. Where is it found? near the right atrium it's near the sup opening of the superior vena cava see superior vena cava comes from top into the right atrium right so right over there that is where the san is located the second part is avn atrioventricular node 
as the name itself suggests atrioventricular means what atrio means atrium and ventricular means ventricles so it's located in between the atrium and ventricle it's located near the interauricular septum what is the interauricular septum we saw the word septum yesterday septum is this separation between the right side and the left side okay now this septum here on top between the two auricles is called interauricular septum and the septum here between the ventricles is called interventricular septum do you understand what's the septum here on top called interauricular septum and the septum here down interventricular septum so this uh, avian node or avian is found near the interauricular septum near the tricuspid valve okay so let's mark it here somewhere over here okay interauricular septum near the tricuspid valve tricuspid valve is on this side right okay so that's the second part so the signal the impulse originates from the san node goes into the avian node and from the avian node there are some branches that go out like this into the left into the ventricles okay these fibers are called bundle of his bundle of his so it begins from the avian it extends to the interventricular septum the bundle of his consists of branches of fibers running along the walls of the ventricle these fibers that run throughout the walls is called purkinje fibers okay so those fibers send the signal to the whole ventricles so this four parts together is called the pacemaker i mean pacemaker is the top part but this whole thing together uh, is part of the pacemaker which keeps the heart beating is we saw about the pacemaker do you remember the pacemaker yes. okay where is the san located what's the full form of san yes. sino atrial node where is it located see here diagram please remember the diagram right auricle near the vena cava okay that is where the the impulse the signal the, the electric current is originating that is the main part of the pacemaker then second one is avian what is avian atrio ventricular node so that's located between the atrium and the ventricles closer to the right side okay right next to the cuspid right right uh, tricuspid valves that's where it is located and then the bundle of his are these uh, how the the impulse goes on to the ventricles and spreads through the purkinje fibers purkinje fibers move around all the way around the uh, ventricles okay now easy and interesting i mean easy topic is that the blood vessels what they are how the differences and all that okay so look at the cross section of an artery and a vein now artery we already spoke about this in the first class arteries how are the walls of the arteries they are very thick because they have to withstand this high pressure the heart is pumping with so high pressure you know you know what happens if the arteries get cut how how far you know blood will spurt out because the heart is pumping and there's a cut you no know, so all the blood will uh, spurt out say how far will the blood spurt you know it can go all the way like from here till the door that far the blood will spray from your hand if an artery gets cut okay so arteries should never get cut so that's why when god created us he put the arteries deeper inside our body it's not found at the surface so what it will really then blood will just ooze out it won't spray and you can close it keep it closed for some time and a clot will form and you'll be okay but if an artery gets cut you can't stop the blood flow clot will form any if there's any cut of clot will form okay but artery is there's too much pressure that a clot also can't be formed okay it's very hard for a clot to form because you'll have to apply a lot of pressure and hold it so that the blood will not come out 
when the blood does not come then a clot can form but still there's too much pressure okay so arteries are thick walled and if you touch an artery you can feel the heartbeat because the heart is pumping directly into the artery right so have you ever felt your heartbeat on an artery yes there are some places where the artery comes to the surface like here come on you are seeing me through that oh, no here all of you put a hand over here in this gap between your throat and this muscle you felt it so there's one artery over there you felt no you felt okay that's the most strongest heartbeat that you can feel because it's closest to your heart okay then the other one is here you all done this before use three fingers that's easy it's most sensitive instead of the thumb okay and in the line of your thumb where your thumb is on that line okay you can put your three fingers and you can feel your heartbeat this is where if you go to the hospital they generally check your heartbeat like they don't put your hand here or they don't check your chest under they have a stethoscope okay this way they can easily find your heartbeat and then there are few more places even in your leg right over here okay we are what is this bone yeah. huh yeah here yeah. here right next to this bone here okay there's a artery over there also you can find that artery somewhere and you can feel it over there yeah, yeah so these are the few places where artery comes to the surface the other arteries are deep inside you can't find it you can't feel it okay they are deep inside okay so the walls are thick and this gap the ho the hole through which the blood flows is called the lumen the lumen is narrow okay walls are thick lumen is narrow even if the artery is empty and there is no blood it will stay open because it's very thick walled you know the lumen will be open okay a vein is opposite the walls are very thin because there is no high pressure inside the blood is just gradually slowly flowing back into the heart so there is no high pressure so veins are narrower the lumen of the vein is big okay big hole for the blood to flow then uh, there are valves in the veins valves prevent the blood from flowing backwards so there are some veins in your hand okay okay how how is the blood flowing through these veins is it going up or going down no huh? it's going back to the heart no veins take the blood back to the heart huh so that means so veins are flowing backwards no what is there how do they move it's still going back up because the blood is pushing from the arteries it has to go back to the heart no so it goes back forget your hand it's always down only your whole body veins are going blood, blood is going upwards only through your veins okay but because of gravity there's a high chance of blood could flow backwards so to prevent the back flow of blood there is valves yeah. valves only allow the blood to go one way it does not allow the blood to go backwards this is how a valve looks okay see this is up it can go up blood can go up through the valve the valve just opens like that but when the blood tries to go back it closes and it holds the blood prevents the blood from going back down you see this valve so when a valve stops the blood from going downwards the sides of the blood vessel become fat like that okay i don't know if i showed you this in h channel did i show you if you try to push the blood back on a valve on a vein it will bulge like this okay so i used to do this when i was small now i have little more flesh can't see the veins but if you find a vein i think this vein now the blood is flowing this way right so if you push it backwards you see it can you see a bulge over here that's a valve okay because i'm trying to push the blood backwards no so that valve is stopping the blood from flowing backwards you can see here on the valve you see it it's bulging here so if you can find a vein amana has lot of veins Uh, just put your just push it backwards backwards means downwards and you will see it bulging okay all right so that's a valve all right so we have arteries we have veins and uh, beginning we saw arteries break into smaller what what are they called ha huh? before becoming capillaries there is something else in between it's called arterioles arterioles are very tiny arteries very tiny almost like capillaries only 
and then the arterioles will again split into smaller capillaries capillary. then the capillaries will join to form venules and venules will join to form bigger veins so now capillaries they are very very narrow see the thickness is 8 micrometers in diameter micrometer is 10 raised to minus 6 meter yeah so 8 micrometers that's the size of bacteria and cells okay that small uh, capillaries are they are made up of a single layer of squamous epithelium cells they have no muscles you know uh, the veins and arteries they are muscular tubes but uh, capillaries no muscles it's just cells one cell two cells it's just thin layer of cells See, if all the blood capillaries of the body were placed end to end in a row, they could extend to a length of 1 lakh kilometers. If you go one full round around the earth, what is the distance? 40,000 kilometers or 50,000 kilometers. Your blood capillaries can go two rounds around the earth. Okay, that many blood capillaries you have in your body, Aman. If you join them, they'll go around the earth two times. Okay. So that many, you have so many blood capillaries and they are so small. That's why they are, if you join them, they become too long. And even though they are so small, their wall surface area would be more than 500 square meters. That's like the whole ground. Okay, your whole football ground. That is the uh, area of the capillaries put together. Okay, so much surface area. Okay, why does it, why do the capillaries have to be so small and thin and so much surface area and all? Through the walls, what happens? Oxygen goes out, carbon dioxide goes in, glucose, all the nutrients also they go out of the capillaries to the neighboring cells, and glucosides, WBC, they squeeze out through amoeboid type of movement. What is the amoeboid type of movement called? Through which the WBC squeeze themselves out through the walls. What is that movement? called there's a word no diapedesis ah, diapedesis the first word you wrote in this chapter check that word textbook nay notebook what's the first word you wrote what is the first word in the last you have it no diapedesis remember these words now okay now capillaries even though they are not made of muscles they have the capacity or capability to contract and dilate contract means become narrow and dilate means expand now if they become narrow what's going to happen less blood will flow through them if they expand more blood will flow through them okay now when do they contract when do they dilate now if it's a very uh, weather okay depends on the weather so suppose it's very cold outside your body needs to trap the heat so less heat should be lost I mean very looking what did I say tell me it should be lost in the cold eh? in the cold heat should be trapped inside your body it should not be lost and if blood flows through your skin all the heat will be lost so your the blood vessels on your skin they will contract so that less blood flows through your skin and less heat is lost clear opposite happens in summer in summer heat should be lost from your body otherwise you'll overheat right so the blood vessels in your skin they will dilate so more blood flows through your skin and so that way more heat is lost okay you can see your face they will turn red in summers red hot it because more blood is flowing through your face so that blood can i mean the heat can be lost okay if it's cold how does your face become it becomes pale pale means no blood in your face all the blood is going inside your body deeper inside so that less heat is lost and your body will trap the heat is that clear so if there's more blood what color your face will become pink and if there's less blood in your face bluish pale bluish color okay okay just rejoin the meeting nathan and ryan Alright, so yesterday we started with the lymph and lymphatic system. We saw that lymph is that fluid, which is a tissue fluid which is taken back to the circulatory system, back to the blood, through these lymph vessels. Now, 
as the lymph vessel is passing through your body, they go into smaller, small uh, places called lymph nodes. Okay? Lymph nodes are like small tanks where the lymph is drained into. And from there, again, it is starting with a new lymph vessel. Okay, I'll read this here. The lymph vessels on the, on, on the way drain lymph into lymph nodes from where fresh lymph channels arise and ultimately pour the lymph vessel into the major arterial veins, anterior veins, close to the entry into the right auricle. And this again in back, back to blood circulation. Okay, So these lymph nodes are on the way. I think there's a picture. Okay, so these are all the lymph vessels in the body. Okay, you can see lymph gland. That lymph gland is like a blood vessel. Sorry, lymph vessel, lymph, there's lymph glands, there's lymph nodes. Spleen is one of the largest lymph or lymphatic organs. We saw that in the spleen, something happens. RBCs are destroyed, WBCs are destroyed in the spleen. The lymph vessels join back close to the heart near the here. See anterior. This is the anterior or the superior vena cava. So just over there, you can see the right lymphatic duct opens into the right subclavian vein. Okay, that's a major vein, subclavian vein, just over there, joins back into the, the circulatory system. Thoracic duct opens into left subclavian vein. Okay, so there's another lymph vessel from this side also joining. So from both sides, you can see lymph vessels are coming and joining. And see here on near your armpits and your groin area. Groin area and the armpits, there are these lymph nodes. Okay. When you get sick, when you have an infection, these uh, germs are in your blood and they are all over. But once they enter into the lymphatic vessels, these germs, bacteria, they get they go to the lymph nodes, and it is at the lymph nodes that our immune system fights against these germs and destroys them at these lymph nodes. So whenever you're sick, sometimes you might have these pains in your lymph nodes because that is where all these fighting is taking place. The WBCs are destroying your uh, destroying the germs on these lymph nodes, armpit area, and the groin area. Okay. Now, how how is it inside your intestines? How does your intestines look? How is the inner part of your intestines? There's no one online. I think I will stop the sharing. No need to have offline. All are off. No one's here, no? Gloria Seha Ahmed. The inner part of your intestines, they have some things like this. Do you know that? What are these structures called? It's called villi. Villus is singular. Villi is plural. What is the purpose of this villi? They help to increase the surface area inside your intestines. So that there's you know, more the surface area, better the rate of absorption. Okay. Now what is present inside this villi? So there are blood vessels. Yeah. There's an artery that artery that comes in and a vein that goes out. Okay, arteriole and a veniole. So what do, what do the, what does the blood do? As the food particles are passing through, they get absorbed into the villus. The villi absorb all these nutrients, carbohydrates, glucose, um, proteins, fats, everything that you eat has to go into your blood, right? 
So this is how it enters into your blood. Now there's uh, there's another small thing inside this. It's called the lacteal that also enters into this villus. The lacteal's work is to absorb fats. Okay, so fats are not absorbed into the blood. Fats are absorbed into the lacteal, and the lacteal is part of the lymphatic system. Okay. So what do, what do the blood vessels absorb? There's two things inside the lacteal, um, in, inside the villi. There's blood vessels and there is lacteal. The blood vessels absorb everything other than fats, but the lacteal absorbs the fats. Okay, And lacteal is part of which system? The lymphatic system. Blood vessels are part of the circulatory system. See, two, we have two systems that circulate in our body. One is the blood and one is the lymph. So blood is in the blood vessels and lymph is in the lymphatic vessel which in which lacteal is a part of. So if you see absorption, the third point, fats from the intestines are absorbed through lymphatic. Lymphatics are lacteals located in the intestinal villi. You understand what's written here now? Lacteals are these things part of the lymphatic system which is present inside this villi. And the purpose of the lacteal is to absorb fats. So that is another function of the limb, absorption of fats. All right. And the last function of the limb, lymphocytes and monocytes of the limb function to defend the body. The lymphatics, lymphatics means all the lymph, the constituents which make up the lymphatic system, they're called lymphatics. The lymphatics also remove bacteria from the tissues. Haven't you experienced ex painful swellings in your groins or in the axle of arms when you get a boil or injury in the limbs? This is a protective sign. Okay, so say you get an infection in your leg or hand. Instead of the infection going in, instead of the bacteria going into your whole body and infecting your whole body, they they are stopped at the groin. I mean your armpit and your groin. That's where the uh, the nodes are present. What nodes? Lymph nodes. Okay, so the lymph nodes are where all this bacteria goes, and it's stopped over there. It does not allow your body doesn't allow it to pass on to your whole body, and the fight happens over here, and they are destroyed right over here. Okay, so you have pain in your groin area and your armpit area if you have any infection in your hand or leg. You know, even tonsils also. Tonsils is also a lymphatic organ. Tonsils also get infected if you are sick. And you have pain in your tonsils. That is very common. You must have experienced the pain in the tonsils. Yes, sir. Okay. And the last organ is the spleen, which is a, a largest, it's a very large, it's a large lymphatic organ. About the size of a clenched fist. Clenched fist. Almost the size of your heart. Okay, so spleen is quite big. It is reddish brown in color and situated in the abdomen behind the stomach. And above the left kidney, the okay, left kidney behind, like kidneys in the back, right? So above the left kidney or behind the stomach is your spleen. Now, what's the function of the spleen? First is it acts like a blood reservoir. Okay, excess blood. If your body requires blood, for example, you have an accident and you lose, lose a lot of blood, the spleen will give that amount of blood back to your circulatory system so that there's not too less blood. Okay, now when your blood is required, is either a hemorrhage. Hemorrhage means loss of blood. Physical or emotional stress or carbon monoxide poisoning. Right? Because all your blood is concentrated with carbon monoxide, you don't have good blood. So your spleen will give that blood to your circulatory system. There's one more organ in your body which acts like a blood reservoir. Which one is that? There's one more organ in your body which stores blood. It acts like a reservoir. Which one is that? Liver. Liver is a much bigger organ. Okay, liver has so many functions. It, it seems it has more than hundred functions. Some say even has, I think, thousand functions. So many different functions. One of the function of the liver is blood reservoir. Next, spleen produces lymphocytes. What are lymphocytes? One of the WBCs. There were five types of WBCs. What's the function of the lymphocytes? Mm -hmm. 
No, that is uh, neutrophils. Lymphocytes work is producing antibody. They constitute about 30% of all the WBCs. They are the smallest of the WBCs. They are one of the two sites. Sites means lymphocyte, monocyte. They are the non-granular WBCs. The granular WBCs, there are three of them. Neutrophils, eosinophils and basophils. Okay, so these lymphocytes are produced in the spleen. It makes sense, no? The word lymphocyte means in the lymph. And spleen is a lymph, well, uh, lymphatic organ. Next, it destroys bone out red blood cells. We saw this. In an embryo, spleen produces RBCs. This also we saw when we were studying about RBCs. Okay, just answer these. What is pulse? Pulse is the alternate expansion and elastic recoil. Okay, there's a definition. Huh? Yeah, yeah, so there's a definition in the book which I have read. So that is your art artery is expanding and contracting because of the heartbeat. And that can be felt in all the arteries in your body. Yesterday I was just talking to one of my friends. And we were seeing yesterday, you know, where all we can feel the heartbeat. How many places we found? Three. But there are nine. In your body, there are nine places where you can feel your heartbeat. Here. Okay, there's an artery right here in your temp. This is your temporal lobe. Do you feel it here? Okay, this is one. Then second is here. Third is here in your hand. Fourth is here. That's where they put no for BP. When they're checking BP, they check your heartbeat over here, right at this point. Four. And I forgot where on. But five was here on your leg, we saw. Six is on your feet. There also there's some place where is there. And then some more there, okay? Over where it is. Okay, next. What is the normal values of blood pressure in a normal human adult? 60 and 120. 120 by 80. 120 is a systolic pressure and 80 is the diastolic pressure. Or you can say a range, like systolic pressure ranges from 120 till 140, I think. And diastolic is 80 to 90. And which kind of cells are mostly found in the lymph? WBC, RBC, platelets. Is everything found in the lymph? No. Which cells are found in the lymph? WBCs. Yeah, not only, not all the WBCs. Some WBCs. Which which WBC? See here. On, so only the leukocyte means WBCs. Right. So only WBCs and mostly which WBC? Lymphocytes. Lymphocytes. Okay. So no RBCs, no platelets. What kind of okay? Next list three functions of lymph. Draining, drainage, nutritive, absorption, defense. There are four functions of the lymph. Nutritive means supplying nutrition and oxygen to places where the blood cannot reach. Drainage means removing all the excess tissue fluid from the body where it does not collect in your body. Absorption means absorbing fats from the villus, villi in your intestines. And defense is lymphocytes and monocytes of the lymph Defend to defend the function to defend the body. The lymphatics also remove bacteria from the tissues. So lymphocytes and monocytes, both the sites, that is the A granular um, WBCs are present present in the lymph. Next, name the two main lymphatic organs in humans. Huh? Spleen. What is it? Ryan, you said something or tonsils. Tonsils. 
which is the main ones? Okay, you can say both. Yeah, then spleen is the one, one of the main ones, then tonsils are there. Okay, name the smallest WBC. We just saw it now. Monocyte. Lymphocytes. Lymphocyte. Right. Yeah, lymphocyte is smallest of the WBC. Monocyte is the largest. Okay. Next, name the following. Part of the lymphatic system concerned with absorption of fats from the intestine. Absorption. What's the answer? Which part of the lymphatic system is concerned with absorption of fats from the intestines? Villi. No, lacteal. Villi is the part of the kidney, uh, intestines and lacteal is the lymphatic vessel, uh, part of the lymphatic system which absorbs the fats. Lacteal is the answer. Next, a special lymphatic node on the sides of the neck. Tonsils. So tonsils is a lymphatic node. I don't think we can call it a lymphatic organ. Okay. Let me just check what are the lymphatic organs. Yeah, you can say spleen, tonsils, thymus. Thymus is in the brain. Thymus. You know. Yeah, tonsil is a good answer. All right, so that's the end of this chapter. Uh, just let's look at this question here. You have to name the blood vessels. Oh, I missed something. Did you see something called hepatic vein? I didn't see that anywhere. Yeah, it's here. Okay, that's the last thing that I have missed out from here. What is a hepatic? No, okay. There are some words that you need to know. Lungs. How do we, what word we, do we use for lungs? Like veins going to the lungs or arteries going to the lungs, veins coming out of the lungs. What's the word we use for lungs? Pulmonary. 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 Then kidneys. Kidneys we're not studying now yet, but we'll be studying it. What do you call kidney, you know? The artery or vein that's going in and coming out of the kidney. Renal. Okay. Just keep these words in mind. Write it down somewhere in kidney. Then, liver. Liver, we say. Hepatic. Then hepatic artery, hepatic vein. Then heart. Any artery or vein. Artery going to the heart. Coronary artery. Any other organ? Yeah, that's it. Write down these words. These are the names of the arteries or veins that enter into these particular organs. So let's look at the hepatic artery and the hepatic vein now. Hepatic means what? It's to do with liver. Right. So anything, any blood vessel that enters into an organ is called an artery and anything that leaves the organ is called a vein. Right. For example, if this is a kidney, the blood vessels that enter into the kidney is called what? Renal veins. Renal artery. And the blood vessel that leaves the kidney is called? Renal vein. Okay, so artery is something that leaves the heart and enters into an organ. A vein is something that leaves an organ and goes back to the heart. That's the main definition of what an artery is and a vein is. You understood, Leah? What's an artery? Kidney? Yeah. You're dreaming, you're not listening, you're looking somewhere else. Any blood vessel, see, this is a heart, this is the kidney. The blood vessel that comes from heart to the kidney is called what? Artery. And goes back from what goes from the kidney back to the heart? Vein. Okay. Now, which one has good blood? Which one has bad blood? Is it the artery or is it the vein? Artery. Artery. Okay. 
So now it's let me explain that to you. Not always, okay? So say you have the heart over here. Here you have a kidney. Uh, here you have stomach. Uh, let's let's move ahead. Here you have intestines, stomach, intestines. Let's remove stomach. Stomach and intestines go together. Here you have liver. Okay, now look at the blood. Heart, it goes into, say, intestines. Now, the, the artery that leaves the heart and goes into the intestine, it's filled with oxygen because it's coming from the lungs. There was lungs here, lungs to heart, and then it's going out of the heart. So this blood that leaves the heart is filled with oxygen. Now, once the blood enters into the intestines and comes out, how is the blood? It's still it's oxygenated. It's not deoxygenated because the intestines did not take the oxygen. Oxygen is supposed to be transmitted, transferred to whom? The cells in the body. Okay. So right now, the oxygen has not gone. In fact, food has been added to the blood. Nutrients have been added to the blood. Because the intestines digested the food, right? So the blood that came into the intestines did not have any nutrients. But the blood that left the intestines, it has nutrients. So even though it's a... I see the diagram, it looks better here. Yeah. So whatever, the, the vessel that left the intestines, even though it's a vein, it has more nutrients than the artery which came into the intestines. Do you understand? So it's not always that arteries have better blood. What do you mean by better blood? Blood could have oxygen in it, blood could have nutrients in it, blood could have poisons in it, it could have carbon dioxide, it could have waste materials. So it's just that when a blood vessel enters into an organ and comes out, it either loses something or it gets something. So when the blood enters into the intestines, it comes out. What change took place to the blood? It got nutrients into it, food, right? Now, what happens when the blood goes into the liver and comes out? What does the liver do to the blood? What does the liver do to this blood? See this blood coming here, it has oxygen, it has nutrients. It might have poisons. Okay, from what you ate. Poisons are removed. Okay, so what is the function of the liver here? To remove poisonous substances present in the blood. So now the blood that comes out of the liver is better than the blood which I went in, right? Because there is it's filled with nutrients and also poisons have been removed. See, in between all this, there is cells, okay? Cells, cells, cells everywhere. So as it's passing through the cells, oxygen is reducing, carbon dioxide is increasing. Next, yes. once the blood enters into kidney, what's happening? What does the kidney do to the blood? Filters the blood. Okay, it removes all the nitrogenous wastes. Amino acids, uric acid, urea, all that is removed. So now the blood is more cleaner. Cleaner means it does not have all these nitrogenous wastes when it came out. So the renal, this is the renal vein. What went in is the renal artery. So the renal vein has lesser wastes compared to the renal artery. See, we cannot always say that artery has better blood than the vein. You understand? Okay. So now look at this diagram and let's try to name each of these things that are marked over here. Sir, the body parts gets this cleaner blood. Yes, as the blood is, this, see, there are cells all over. At every point, Everywhere there are cells. Okay? And as the blood is passing through all these different organs, oxygen and glucose are being sent to all these cells. And all, all these organs on the way, they're just making the blood better, cleaning the blood, nourishing the blood, removing wastes as it's passing through your body. If one of these organs fail, suppose kidney is failed, then the function of the kidney, which is to purify the blood, will not happen. And the blood will keep getting these nitrogenous wastes. They'll keep collecting in the blood, making the blood more and more poisonous. Okay, everything else will work. Heart will pump, intestine will give the food, liver will remove the poisonous substances. But what the kidney is supposed to do, that doesn't happen. So eventually, as the blood is circulating, it will keep gathering all these nitrogenous wastes. When the wastes become too high, that person can die. Right? Okay. 
coming to our diagram over here. Let's start with number one. What is number one? Heart. No, three is the heart. Two is, two is the lungs. Three is the heart, two is the lungs. What is one? One is this vein. Okay, what vein or what is the vein or artery? It's vein. See the arrow. It's leaving the heart. Renal vein. Renal. And a heart to lungs. What is it called? Number one. Pulmonary. Pulmonary. Okay, pulmonary because it's going to the lungs. Pulmonary what? Hmm? It's an artery, no? It's leaving the heart. What leaves the heart is artery. What enters into the heart is vein. That's the definition of artery and vein. An artery is a blood vessel, vessel which leaves the heart. A vein is a blood vessel which comes back to the heart. So number one is what? Pulmonary artery. Number two is lungs. Three heart. What's number four? It's coming from lungs to the heart. Yeah, what is it? We are done with this already, you should know this. Pulmonary? Vein. Vein is bringing the blood back to the heart. Next, what's number five? Arteries. Name it. It's leaving the heart. That's like artery. Yeah, it's an artery, but which artery? The main artery which leaves the heart. Iota. You remember what's Iota? I forgot. It's a blood vessel that leaves the heart. Right, Iota. It's the biggest artery taking all this oxygenated blood. See where the blood is going now? One artery goes to the liver. Another artery goes here. Another artery goes to the intestines. Okay. So, what's number six? Let's see number six. It's going to the liver. Huh? Yeah. Hepatic artery. Hepatic means liver. Right. And it's going to the liver. So hepatic artery. Next. Number seven. Now number seven is going from the intestines to the liver. So what, what should we call this? It's going to the liver. So hepatic. But is it artery or vein? But there's already artery here, no? Okay, so for this, I need to explain to you something. Okay, so listen. See, this is your liver. Okay, there's a blood vessel that enters into your liver and there's a blood vessel that exits your liver. Okay, so the one that's entering into your liver is what? Hepatic artery. And the one that's leaving your liver is? Hepatic vein. Hepatic vein. Correct. This is simple and clear. Hepatic artery entering into the liver, hepatic vein leaving the liver. But right below this, you have your stomach and your intestines. And we, we also saw that there's a blood vessel which goes from stomach and intestines to the liver right, to remove the poisons. Right. Uh, once the blood enters into your stomach and intestines, then it goes into the liver. So there's are two different blood vessels, one entering into your liver directly from the heart. That is that is supplying oxygenated blood to the liver because liver also needs oxygen. But the second blood vessel here is taking all the nutrients and going to the liver to remove the poisons. Because when you eat, you might eat some poisons and that goes to the liver so that the poisons are removed. So what do you call this now? So there is a blood vessel which enters into the stomach and intestine. This is an artery. 
what happens to the artery it separates splits into capillaries and then these capillaries they join again if they join what do they become Veins. and then it has to be a vein so this has to be a vein you understand because arteries always break into capillaries and rejoin to become veins and then vein is supposed to just go back to the heart but this vein over here it again splits when it enters into the liver it splits again so this vein is it has a special name it's not just a vein it's called a portal vein Portal vein is a vein that starts with capillaries and ends with capillaries. That's a portal vein. What's a portal vein? Starts with capillaries and ends with capillaries. Normally veins, how they, they just start with capillaries. They don't end with capillaries. They just end back as a single vein and goes back to the heart. But here the vein is again splitting into capillaries, which is very different than what normal veins do. Right? Veins generally don't split, split into capillaries. But these veins do. So this vein has a special name, which is called portal vein. Next, this portal vein is going to the liver. So we call it a hepatic portal vein. Is everyone clear the name of this blood vessel? The hepatic portal vein. All right. So we have a hepatic artery entering into the liver. We have a hepatic portal vein entering into the liver from the intestines. And we have a hepatic vein that is leaving the liver. Everyone clear on this? Draw this diagram. Okay, coming back to our diagram. What's number six? Okay, number six is the hepatic artery entering into the liver. What's number seven? Mm -hmm. See, it's coming from intestines and going to liver. So that is hepatic portal vein. Next, number eight. Eight is coming out from what? Kidneys. So that is yeah. renal. Renal what? Vein. Number nine. From the head to the heart. Superior vena cava. Vein. Superior vena cava. Yeah, it's a vein, but you have to tell the name. Okay, number 10. Stomach. Stomach. That's it. Write this down. 